Amen. So Ephesians chapter 5, of course, talking about the relationship uh, between Christ and the church there at the end of the, the chapter and how that reflects uh, on a marriage and the relationship between a man and his wife or a husband and his wife. So this, um, s this sermon, um, similarly to last week's sermon, is going to be a sermon that you're, you're not going to hear too many other places. Um, you know, and ladies, let me just say this, you know, uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm, I'm pretty hard on the men in this church, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, yelling and screaming and pounding on the pulpit really directed at the men. And the reason for that is because when it comes to the family, when it comes to the roles in the church and the family especially, uh, the men are the, you know, they have the leadership role. They're the responsible party. So if you're not hard on the responsible party and you're not teaching the responsible party on you know, what to do and how to lead, you know, you're going to realize that things will go south pretty quickly. Look down there at Ephesians chapter 5 and look at verse 22. And the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, last week I gave the ladies, the, the wives, a pass. So you have to turn in your pass for this morning's sermon. Um, this morning's sermon is about the submissive wife and how to be a biblical wife according to the Bible. And this is not politically correct today. So you are not going to hear this taught in the world. And this is pretty much the opposite of what the world today is teaching. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. So we see in Ephesians chapter 5, ladies, that you are to be subject, the wives are to be subject to their husbands in everything, it says in verse number 24. You say, what does that mean? Well, in everything, the Bible says. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 5 for now. The Bible says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Now turn to Colossians chapter 3. So you're to be in subjection. You're to boast to be a subject to your, your husband just as Christ, you know, the church is a subject to Christ. It's a direct comparison in Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians chapter 5. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, it's in everything, in everything, in all things. But you say, what if, what if my husband, who I'm subject to, is asking me to do something that's against the Lord or against the Bible? Well, look at Colossians 3.18. The Bible clarifies in a little bit more detail in Colossians 3.18. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And this is, of course, you know, as it is fit in the Lord. So you're subject. We can take these verses together. And wives, you are subject. You are to submit to your husband as it is fit in the Lord. You say, well, it doesn't say that in Ephesians chapter 5. Well, it's talking about a direct comparison from the church to being subject to Christ, which means that it's, Christ is the Lord. Okay, so as it is fit in the Lord, you are to be submissive, you are to be a subject to your husband, you are to follow your husband's leadership in everything, the Bible says. So, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, what does that actually look like? Like, wives, I mean, they're, first of all, with spiritual matters, it means that you are to follow the spiritual direction of your husband. You know, so as long as, of course, as long as that spiritual direction is in line with the Bible. It, this is the same concept, by the way, as Romans chapter 13, being subject to the higher powers. So we are always subject to the higher powers, and God is obviously our highest power. So we're to, you know, listen to the government, follow the government, as long as it doesn't violate what the Bible says. If the Bible, you know, says something that the government is telling us to go against the Bible, then we don't have to follow that command. It's the same idea here as wives being subject to their husbands as it is fit in the Lord, or as the church is subject to Christ. So look, ladies, wives, your husband should define the spiritual direction for your family, and you should follow it. You should, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Now, here's the thing. You say, I don't want to. You say, I don't like following my husband in certain areas. But here's the thing about, about subjection that you have to understand. 
Subjection itself means you follow somebody else's way. Means you do something that's not your way, that's somebody else's way. You may agree with it, or you may not. The Bible says, I mean, look, if, if you could not be, look, if, if anybody, men or women, you know, cannot be in subjection to anyone in their life, you're going to have a very difficult life. Let me just go ahead and tell you that right now. Because, look, if you, if you can't put yourself, this is for men and women, if you have a man or a woman that can't put themselves in subjection to anybody, you're going to have a tough go at life. Let me, let me tell you that. Look, your husband, ladies, I guarantee you, your husband is in subjection to many people in his life. You say, well, you know, I, I don't think so. Well, I, I don't care what man is in this room. He is in subjection to people in his life. First of all, if you're coming to church, you're in subjection to, you know, the church leadership and the pastor of the church, you know, that you're, you're voluntarily putting yourself underneath that leadership. You're in subjection to that leadership when it comes to matters of the church. I guarantee every single man in here, whether he owns his own business or not, is in subjection to people in his business that he does. You say, well, I own my own business. Well, don't you have customers? I mean, the customer's always right, right? You're in subjection to your customers. You're in subjection to people you do business with. Look, every single man in here would be a complete failure in his life if he could not put himself under subjection or under authority. So it's not something that your husband can't do, so why can't you do it? So look, your husband's in subjection to plenty of people. You are in subjection, the Bible says, to your husband if you're married. And in his life, he's in subjection to God. Everybody is in subjection to God. So you say, so you say here's what a lot of people will say today. Even Christian churches will teach this today. They'll say, so why can't we both, the husband and the wife, why can't we both be in subjection to God and just have this thing be 50-50? Why, why can't we do that? Well, here's the, here's the reason why. Okay, here's the reason why. It's because the Bible, the Bible doesn't define every specific detail of every specific situation you're going to be in. The Bible gives doctrines. The Bible gives examples of, you know, historical stories and different, you know, doctrines and philosophies and, and how God, look, with the Bible, we see the mind of God. We see how God feels towards us and we see how we are supposed to act on this earth. But we must apply the Bible to specific situations in our life. The Bible does not have a specific story covering every single situation you are going to run in, into in your marriage. You must apply doctrines of the Bible onto the situation. You know, example, I mean, where are you going to go to church? What church in Fresno are you going to choose to go to? The Bible does not have a list of churches in Fresno that in, in telling you which one to go to. You must apply biblical doctrines onto decisions that you will make in your life. I mean, the Bible does not tell you which homeschooling curriculum to use. The Bible has very clear doctrines and very clear teaching that you should be teaching your children and teaching your children at home. I mean, the Bible does not tell you which standards you will set in place for your family. It gives you the doctrines on how to do that, but it doesn't tell you specifically which businesses and restaurants and places that you should go to and should not go to according to the standards of your family. Someone is going to have to define these types of details. Somebody has to apply these biblical concepts to everyday life and make these decisions. There needs to be a leader. And look, no situation no situation in any organization has 50-50 across the board, everybody's in charge. It's stupid. No one would even do that. Even secular, I mean, think of secular organizations. There's not a singular secular organization out there where everybody just has equal say in everything all the time. It's ridiculous to even think about it. A business couldn't run that way. Somebody has to be in charge. That's why, men, when you go to work, you have, you know, you have a foreman and a superintendent and a manager, and you have this hierarchy of leadership. 
Because even secular organizations have figured out that you can't just have everybody in charge of everything. It would be a disaster. It would be a mess. So look, ladies, spiritually, if you have a husband, I mean churches, think of it. Church, even God, the organization that God has defined, has specific leadership set up. There's entire you know, chapters in the Bible talking about the organization of a church and who's to lead the church and who's to help the leader of the church and what can be done and what can't be done and even who the leader can be. You know, can the leader be a man? Can it be a woman? Can it just be anybody? No. It has to be a very specific person with very specific qualifications. So God even understands, of course, understands that, you know, organizations need leadership. And in the family, that leader is the man. So look, ladies, if you have a man, a husband, who is leading and choosing the spiritual direction for your family, you know, you have a gem on your hands, first of all. You know, embrace that. You know, here's the thing. At least after today, you're going to know what the Bible says. You know, and it, if it wouldn't, look, if it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be submission or subjection if it was just all your way. That, that would be you leading. If it was just all everything that you wanted to do all the time, and that's what you did, that's not submission. That's not subjection at all. That's leading. That's leading. And the Bible says that's your husband. Let's look at matters of the home. The husband should define the vision for the household. Remember last week? You know, what is his vision for the household? You say, you say you're sitting in the chairs there, and you're like, my husband doesn't have a vision for the household. He doesn't have one. Well, maybe you should encourage him to get one. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. You should encourage him. And then, you know, when you get this vision, his vision for the family, you should support it and get behind it. Look at Proverbs chapter 31, talking about the virtuous woman. Now, here's the thing about the virtuous woman. Look at verse 11 of Proverbs chapter 31. We're talking about the virtuous woman, the woman um, that the Bible is, is teaching about here that you know, all women and all wives should strive to be, the Proverbs 31 woman. Look at what the Bible says about her in verse 11. It says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So as your husband is leading the family, let me tell you something about leaders. Every single leader needs people that he can trust. Every single leader needs people he can count on. He needs someone, as your husband's leading his family, he needs a spouse, he needs a wife that he knows has his back. And that's this man in Proverbs chapter 31. He knows that his wife supports him, she has his back, and his heart is just completely trusting in her. As I told you with a leader, you know, last week, a good leader will take somebody who's weak and, and make them strong. That's what a good leader will do. A good wife, a good wife will strengthen her husband even when he is weak. That's what a good wife will do. And that's what the wife of Proverbs chapter 31 is doing. Look, a bad wife will attack her husband in moments when he is down. Maybe, because do you think, do you think as, as a leader, do you think that your husband, is your husband God? Is your husband going to make every single decision the, in the correct way? No, he's not. He's not. Which means that, you know, he's going to make mistakes. There's going to be times when your husband is up, and there's going to be times when your husband is down in his role in leading the family. But look, a bad wife and a wife who is not the Proverbs 31 woman is someone who would attack in those moments, who would, who would push him down. He would be in a weak moment, and she would push him down further. But the Proverbs 31 woman was someone who would take her husband when he was in a down situation and lift him up. You know, maybe, I mean, maybe, I mean, just practically speaking, maybe his business is not doing well. Maybe he did, uh, made some decisions in business that just, things just aren't going well with the way he decided to go. You know, a good wife would encourage and support him in those times. And guess what? Guess what? As a man who's been down, 
times in his life before, he will remember those times. He will remember, this is how men operate. Here's a window into the mind of men. Men operate, first of all, I appreciate the times in my life. Looking back, I didn't appreciate them at the time, but I appreciate the times in my life when I was down. My wife and I talk about this a lot, that we're glad we had those times where maybe finances weren't, weren't good. We're glad looking back on those times that we were going through difficult situations. But let me tell you something about men. Men will remember who was with them and who was not with them when they're down. Because guess what? It's easy to be supportive and follow somebody who's just up all the time. That's why you find all these, look, that's why you find all these rich celebrities, they just have tons of friends all the time. All these super rich people, they just have tons of people that want to be around them all the time. Because they're, they're up. But look, when people like that get down, there's nobody there. Everybody flees. What's important, and how you know who you can really trust, and this is a super important you know, point for a marriage, you know, as your husband leads, and he leads through spiritual matters, and he leads through you know, supporting the family, and he leads through all these situations, there's going to be times where maybe you know, he gets laid off, or maybe you know, finances are really tough, and maybe he can't find a job that, where he made as much money as he used to make, and maybe things are really struggling right now. And let me tell you something, if you're the Proverbs 31 woman in that situation, he will look at you as priceless, just, be, just as Pro Proverbs 31 says. Because that's who you find out. That's who men find out, you know, who they can trust. And that will draw him closer to you. This man in Proverbs chapter 31, he knew that his wife was with him through thick and thin, no matter what. Up or down, up or down, she's with me. That's where his heart was at. And he's like, and, and this guy, he's like, keep the rubies. She's priceless. That's what he was like. And that's, look, that's the power, ladies, that you have. You know, that's, that, I mean, you think, oh, I'm not in charge, so that means that, no, that is a huge role for you to support your husband and to be that, you know, that, that force that can prop him up through tough times. So in this vision for the family, he is to, you know, he is to define the vision for the children. He is to define the vision for their schooling. He is to define the vision for the provisions, for the finances of the family. You know, he could, you know, down to what we eat for supper, your husband can define this level of, you know, vision. Help him realize this vision for your family. That's your role. See, the world out there, especially today, will tell you to compete with your husband. It will tell you that if your husband is trying to lead your family, that he's being oppressive and you shouldn't put up with that. But look, the things that you do will show your support for his agenda. And for, you know, or you could be bitter at his role and see how that works. And try to take it away from him. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's what the world teaches. This is not... Like, what the world is teaching is not God's plan. It's against it. And look, here's the thing. I don't know how many times I've said this in how many different sermons, but, you know, you're best if you just do it God's way. Just do it God's way. Get on His plan and help Him with it. If you have ideas, look, if you have ideas, ask Him. Ask your husband. Hey, I have ideas. That's, su that's support. That's supporting Him. You know don't just take matters into your own hands. You know, it's the same thing, you know, in a, in a church. There's leadership here. You know, you can't just take it matters into your own hands in the church. Look, it's the same at home, ladies. If you have ideas, bring it up to your husband. He's in charge. It will show, and that, that's another thing, that will show your submission to his authority. That will show your, you know, respect for his authority. Look, ladies, it's a heavy burden to be in charge. It is a heavy burden to be in charge, especially in difficult times. Help him with it. And show that you are submissive to him and you are subject to him. He doesn't need to have this burden of leadership and also have a wife that is not subject, subjected to him and competing with him. That, that's, that's not supporting him. That's, that's weighing him down. All right? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I really have two points. The first one is, you know, you're to be a subject to your husband, period. 
You're to be a subject to your husband. He is in charge. And as, as it is fit in the Lord, you're to just do what He says. It's very simple. Help Him. Support Him. Look, you can be very good at this. And you can help Him succeed. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. My second point is this. It's the verse of the week on your bulletin. Look at verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So the second point I want to make tonight, or this morning, is that ladies, you are to reverence your husband. Not only are you to be in subjection to him, but you are to reverence him. What does that mean? Reverence, the definition means a deep respect for someone. Look, the, the position of the husband, of the leader of the family, is a position that the Bible says the wife is to reverence. You are to reverence your husband. And now look, it's super interesting because I've heard this, I've heard this said so many times. Like just a secular statement. You know, that, I don't know if you've heard this before, but women, women desire love and affection and men desire respect. I mean, I've heard that said so many times, but isn't that interesting that Ephesians chapter 5.33, I mean, that, that statement that I've heard so many times, it's true. Women want to feel loved, and they want to feel like their husband cares about them, and, you know, their husband is, is you know, focused on them and is, is affectionate towards them. This is what women want. Men want respect. That's what men want. That's what you will see men hunting their whole life for. That's what you'll see men out in the business world. They want respect. And, you know, most men out in the business world, they want respect so badly, and it drives them crazy because they can't get it. They don't know how to get it. They're out there, and they're demanding that people respect them. This is the boss that gets the job, and in, in two weeks he's saying, you have to listen to me because I'm the boss. Don't you know I'm in charge here? You know, look, if I have to tell you that I'm in charge here, that means I've completely lost control of the situation. You don't demand respect. But the Bible says that your husband, that a wife is supposed to respect and reverence her husband. Which is interesting because what Ephesians 5.33 is telling us is that we're to do these things that our conscience already wants. Our conscience, as a man, my conscience wants my wife to respect me. My, my, that's what I want. That's what my need is. As, as a woman, you know, the Bible says, you know, my wife wants me to love her, to show my love for her. That's a, it, the Bible is telling us exactly what we want in Ephesians 5.33. It's actually giving us the medicine to feed what we actually are wired to desire. Does that make sense? So Ephesians 5, I mean, it's just another, it's another, um, you know, it's another perfect example of the Bible being a miracle, that it just completely fits what we need. But here's what's interesting. It's what's interesting. Um, women, you're to respect your husband. Show reverence towards him. And look, this means that you're to do that whether you feel like it or not. Okay, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this in, in, in two ways. First of all, let's talk about your speech. Let's talk about your speech. Because the Bible actually is very specific on this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and starting in verse number 1. Let me ask you a question, ladies. How do you speak to your husband? How do you speak to your husband? Do you speak to your husband in a respectful way? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at the, what the Bible says here. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Same thing we've been talking about. That if any obey not the word... They also may, may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, when it says that if any obey not the word, that's talking about the husband. We'll get to that in a minute. But it says that they'll be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, just underline every time there's something that says something about speaking here. Verse 3, Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair and a wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the right sight of God of great, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed 
Abraham. It says she was in subjection to Abraham. And then what kind of example does it give here? Calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. It's super interesting here that we are talking about holy women that are in subjection to their husbands, and it is almost completely focused on their conversation. It is almost completely focused on how they speak to their husband in 1 Peter chapter 3. The words that these women speak is brought up like five different times in the passage that I just wrote you. It's, it's used as an example, as the example in 1 Peter chapter 3, of showing that these women are in subjection to their husbands. Meaning that if you speak to your husband in a certain way, it can be viewed that you're not in subjection to him. Meaning that the holy women who are in subjection to their wives... I mean, think of Sarah. Think of Sarah. I mean, Sarah. Do you think that Sarah in her life, do you think that she did any great things for the Lord? I mean, I'm thinking probably. You know, I mean, she probably did some amazing things for the Lord in her life. But what is the thing that the Bible brings up? The, things that the, th the one thing that the Bible brings up about Sarah here in the New Testament is that she was respectful to her husband. She was subject to her husband, and she spoke to him in, in, a, in, in, a, to in a tone of reverence, calling him Lord. Look, I'm not saying your, your wife needs to call you Lord, or you need to call your husband Lord, but that is the example that the Bible is using to show that Sarah was in subjection to Abraham. How she what? How she spoke to him. So, how do you speak to your husband? Are, are you, you know, let's talk about, you know, how do you speak to your husband, ladies? Does this sound like, you know, you? That, you know, you're, you're just super respectful to your husband as, you know, you know the, the, the church is subject to Christ. Is that how you speak to your husband? I mean, is that it? Because look, I'm guessing that you're pro you know, this is the problem with becoming casual with each other, by the way. This is the problem, you know, as, as you're married for years and years and years. This is a problem with, with dating, by the way, too. A huge problem with dating. That these, these, these teenagers or young people that date, they get too casual with each other. And pretty soon, before they even get into marriage, this, re this reverence is lost already. It, it's lost. So, I mean... Back to husbands and wives, don't get too casual with each other. Because, you know, don't act, because pretty soon you're going to start treating each other like your roommates and like your buddies. And the problem is, is that being too casual, first of all, first of all, being casual in general is, is pretty much always a bad thing. It's always better to be more formal. Always better. But in a marriage, here's the problem with being too casual. If you're just too casual with your wife and your wife, the wives are too casual with the husband, you know what? You'll start to lose this reverence. Your husband will stop feeling this reverence. And he, look, he'll, he'll, you know, your, your marriage will suffer from being too casual with each other. And your husband will not be, he may not even know why he's unhappy with you, but if you're just speaking to your husband like he's your buddy or, you know, he's like just your, your friend or something like this and you're getting way too casual with him, it, it, he's going to realize, he's going to start thinking that you're not reverencing him and you're not being subject to him anymore. And look, he will not like it. He may not even know why he doesn't like it, but he will, he will look at it, he will begin to look at it as disrespect. And ultimately, Ultimately, he'll think that you don't appreciate him, is what will happen. You say, oh, just being casual. Just being casual. Yeah, I mean, just being casual with him, like, you know, you're not ever surprised to see him or happy to see him or anything like that, and in the way that you speak and the way that you act. Look, on the contrary, ladies, you should treat your husband. You should speak to your husband like he is going out every single day and fighting monsters for you. That's how you should speak to your husband. And that will keep that level of respect that you're supposed to have for him. Let me give you an example. When is the last time, ladies, ladies, men relax. Ladies, when is the last time you waited for your husband to get home and you met him at the door 
and you gave him a hug and a kiss and said, I appreciate you working so hard for us. How long would that take? I don't know, three seconds? When's the last time that you did that? When's the last time that you got up in the morning when he got up early and you got up and you gave him a hug and a kiss goodbye and said, thanks for working so hard for our family? When is the last time that you did that? And so, you know, just, when, when, I mean, look, those, I'm telling you, for your husband, those are those priceless moments. That will define his entire day. That will make, I mean, that, you know what? That is where the husband will be like, forget the rubies. My wife is priceless. The wife that makes that effort to have that type of conversation and those type of actions that show that reverence towards her husband. But look, it takes effort. It takes effort. It's not just accidentally that that's going to happen. You have to actually have, just like it takes your husband effort to show his love towards you. He, look, your husband's not showing love towards you by being to himself like, man, I really love my wife, thinking to himself. No, he's going to go out and take some action that shows that love towards his wife. In the same manner also, to show reverence to your husband is, some, is going to be some work. It's going to take some sacrifice. Look, it takes effort for your husband to lead the home. It takes effort. It's the same thing for you. It takes effort for your husband to find a good church for you. That takes effort to define the boundaries of the family, to define standards, to support and define the visions he has for you and the kids. It actually takes effort in the same way to show reverence to your husband. Are you making that effort is the question this morning. Are you making that effort for your husband? Because look, these things, look, these things, these things are not going to happen on accident. This is what it takes to have a great marriage, folks. This is what it takes. I mean, you, I mean, get married forever. You're never to get divorced. I can stand up here. Divorce is bad. But how about this? How about we not shoot for the lowest common denominator? And we actually try to, as men, do what we're supposed to be doing as men and realize that the Bible, what the Bible is telling us to do as men is go out and take some effort that would not naturally come to us if we weren't reading the Bible. Because we have this stupid thing called the flesh that, you know, we're, we're burdened with until we die that's pulling us to be selfish and to not care about other people, but the Bible says I should do this, so just do it. How about we strive for great marriages? And we not strive for just, hey, I've been married for 75 years and it was a nightmare the entire time. I know people like that. They, at the funeral, at the funeral, they're like, they didn't get divorced. <laughs> they were miserable and they tortured each other for 70 years. How about we try to have great marriages? I mean, it's not rocket science, but it takes effort. That's the problem. That's the problem. It takes effort on both sides. You may not feel like doing it all the time. You may not feel like reverencing your husband. You may not feel like showing love to your wife, but that's what you're supposed to do if you want to have a great marriage. And you know what? Just as you know, being married to somebody for 50, 60 years and it being the most miserable time you could ever have on any planet anywhere, just as that could be the case, a, a great marriage could be the best blessing you'll ever have on this earth. I mean, who, I mean, what in the world? Path A, path B. Who would not choose this? But it takes a little bit of effort. Just do it God's way. It's not going to happen on accident. So, singles, I don't want you to feel left out. So we see that, that we need, you need to be in subjection to your husband. You just need to follow his leadership. You need to encourage him to lead. If you say, oh, you know, there's this big hole right here. He's not really leading in this area. Maybe, you know, bring it up in a respectful way and say, hey, could you help? Let's, let's define a, you know, could you define a plan for us here? I'm really struggling here. And encourage him to, to lead in the areas that he's not. Lift him up in areas where he's weak. Make him strong in areas where he's weak by supporting him, 
by having his back, no matter what he's going through, just, just be supportive of him and be in subjection to him and then show him reverence. Look, that's not, it's not a feeling that you have. You sitting here just like the husband's role, it's not just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I respect him. No, you have to show that. Show that. So singles, single ladies, let me just say this. Single ladies, first of all, your husband, your future husband, is going to lead you. Your future husband is going to lead you in everything. As it is fit in the Lord. So you need to remember this, single ladies. That, you know, you don't need to just be out there looking for a pretty face. Or looking for a good job. Or whatever that you think that you should be looking for. Because look, you're going to be, according to the Bible, you're going to be subject to this person your entire life. And here's a, here's a problem with single ladies. Single ladies have this, this disease or whatever it is, this chronic condition that thinks, I can fix anything. I, they'll find some guy and maybe they really want to be married and they're like, yeah, but you know, he's, you know, he's got a drinking problem or you know, he doesn't go to church and all this, but you know, I can fix him. No. Let go of this. Let go of this attitude. You need to find one. Here's some risk management for your entire life, single ladies. Find one that's fixed already. Because ladies, they have this idea that they can fix him. And that could cost you your entire life. Because look, you are to follow. You are to be in subjection to the person that you marry. You're not in subjection to him yet. You're not in subjection until you marry him. But look, marrying them and then deciding to not follow them because they're not getting fixed like you thought that they would, that's not an option. That's not an option. Which leads me to you know, my last point here is that, that what if my husband is not doing his job? What if you marry somebody that you thought you could fix and he's not fixable? The point is this. You are to do your job anyway. That's why single ladies, you need to be careful who you marry. You need to marry your spiritual equal. You need to be equally yoked, the Bible would say. Because you are going to be expected to do your job anyway. To be in your role anyway. Notice, as we talked about husbands and wives, there was never any clause in these statements that says, as long as he does his part. Or, husbands, love your wives as long as she does this. Or, Wives, reverence your husband as long as he does this. No, there's no clause like that. You are, as a matter of fact, go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite is what the Bible says. The Bible actually gives an example of a husband who's not doing what he's supposed to do, and it tells the wife what she's supposed to do anyway. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And look at verse number one. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. Look, this is a husband who's not doing what he's supposed to do. It says, if any, meaning if, if any husband obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. The Bible here is saying is that, hey, if you want to, help your husband get right. If he's not following the Bible, you want to help him get right, here's what you do. You still be in subjection to him. You still you know, have reverence towards him in specifically conversation here, the Bible is saying, and that that will win him over. That is your best chance at winning him over. Yet, here's what you'll see women do. My husband's not doing what he's supposed to do, so I'm going to nag him to death. I'm going to harass him and just tell him all the time about how stupid he is and how he's not doing the right thing and how he's not leading this family correctly and just nag him and nag him and nag him. And you know what you're going to end up with? You're going to end up with a husband who's in the woods. You're going to end up with a husband who's in the attic of the house. You say, where's my husband? Well, you know, he ran away. You say, he's not doing the right thing. It says, you know, still have reverent conversation. Still be in subjection to him. You do your job anyway. And that goes for the husbands too. That goes for the husbands too. My wife, she's not doing her job and she's not being in subjection to me and she's not listening and she's not, you know, reverencing me like she should be. 
You still love her. You still show your love towards her. That is your best chance at getting her to get right with God. You do your job anyway. You do your job anyway. Which brings me, you know, to finally, just the last thing I want to say here. You have to forget, and, and I think that even, even us, even us, I can see it in certain places, but I think even us in this church, as much as we teach separation, as much as we practice separation, I think that we're still influenced by the world. That's what I think. I think that we're still influenced by the world, you know, because the world teaches here, the world is like, the world is going 120 miles an hour against what I'm teaching you this morning in the opposite direction. They're teaching that you need to compete with your husband, that you need to have control of your husband. They're teaching this 50-50, which is stupid. It never works that way. What they're really teaching is that the woman should be in charge. The Bible says it's your husband. The media, I mean, in a world, I mean, just think of the media. Think of the media. The, the world in this media, from, from TV shows to movies to whatever you see on TV or YouTube, it's, it's the man is always the bad guy. The man is the idiot on, on every sitcom that there's ever been with a family in it. He's, you know, he's a weakling. He's a fool. The man's a fool. The, he's the butt of all the jokes. Look, all this stuff is a worldly attack on the male headship of the home that the Bible is teaching. That's what all, and it's very effective. It's very effective. Then, then the woman, the woman in all these sitcoms or TV shows or whatever, she comes in, she's super smart, and she like, she like fixes her dumb husband's mistakes all the time. There's entire shows that are just based on that right there. Every single episode, husband does something stupid and super smart wife comes in. But here's the thing, folks, it's not about intelligence. My wife is way smarter than I am. It's not about intelligence. It's about the position that God has put you in in the family and the structure of the family. I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with intelligence. God, God wasn't like the women aren't as smart as the men, so the men need to be in charge. No. No. He made the man in charge, and then he put a support structure in there for him because, look, being in charge takes a lot of support. To the point where if you have no support, many times leadership will fail. It's a super important role. I remember there was a news story 10 or more years ago, and I remember just telling my, showing my, my wife this news story, but it was a secular news story. It was like a 60 Minutes or a Dateline, one of these hour-long shows. And it was this story about this family. It was about this husband and this wife, and they were constantly, the story was this. It was not religious. It was not based on any, any Bible doctrine or anything. But here he had a husband and a wife who were just constantly at each other's throats. And it was this marriage where he had made a bunch of financial decisions that were bad, and his wife was constantly beating him down. And they were to the point where they were ready to get divorced. Nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with anything. Just a, a secular marriage where they were, it was about to fall apart. And the woman, the woman just said, you know what? She's like, I can't handle it anymore. I'm just submitting to his authority. She came to this conclusion by herself. And, and the news story, the 60 Minutes news story, it was like, they're like, I mean, it was just like, it was like they had found a unicorn. They're like, and, and she decided to just follow everything that this moron, you know, wanted to do in their marriage. And, and it's like, in this story, the story works out like the Bible said it would work out. These people weren't saved. But here, she submitted to the authority of her husband. The marriage just flipped on its head just like that. And like, suddenly the marriage was way better. And, and, but the news story was still like, how could she do this? But you talk to the couple, they interview the couple, they're like, oh, this, things are great. We're just loving our marriage. We're just falling in love again. And all that. I mean, the, the whole thing, and they're just like, but she just listens to everything that he says. You know, the reporter's like, can you believe this? I mean, it was just this huge biased story against this because they couldn't believe that some woman would make this decision. Look, that's what the Bible says. She just accidentally made a choice that was in line with the Bible, and it basically saved her family. And all of a sudden, his business turned around and all this stuff. And it was funny because it wasn't the point of the story at all, but I, I recognized it as, you know, just just being the right thing that she needed to do. But, I mean, to the world, this is crazy, what I'm teaching you this morning. 
when I'm teaching you this morning. She just decided to submit and to let him lead, and the story was just fascinated that they now had a, a happy marriage. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was crazy. Look, folks, try it God's way. Amen. Try it God's way. Because when you get outside God's plan, it's all going to come apart when you get outside that plan. It's a major theme in the Bible that applies to most things I say from the pulpit here. But here's one last thought for you. Ladies, one last thought for you this morning. This may shock you, but did you know that your husband did not write the Bible? You're like, what? Your husband, you say, what do I mean by that? First of all, what I mean by that is that your husband did not write the Bible. So in any, at any point in your life, at any area in your life where you're saying, you know what, I agree 90% of the time. Look, first of all, if you're just doing things that you agree with, that's not submission. I've already said that. And this 10% area, I'm just not going to go along with him on. Your husband didn't write the Bible. You're not disobeying your husband. You're disobeying God. I mean, that, look, you're all saved. You all believe the Bible. I just want to throw that out there as something to just think about. You are not, if, in every single area where you are not submitting to your husband, by the, by the way, I don't think that it's a 5% area. I think that if you're not submitting in 5 or 10% of the area, you're not submitting at all. Because you're going along with everything you agree with, and then the areas you don't agree with, you're not submitting, meaning you're not submitting at all. Because submitting means, you know what? Uh, they want to do it that way. I don't agree, but I'm, I'm in submission to this. We're going to do it that way. As it is fit in the Lord. So your husband didn't write the Bible. You're not disobeying him. You're disobeying God. Keep that in mind. You know what the Bible says. Everybody here knows what the Bible says. This is not complicated doctrine. It's not your husband you're disobeying. So reverence your husband be in subjection to your husband. But look, support him. It's a hugely important role. Look, if it wasn't an important role, ladies, and that's another thing that really, really irritates me about what the world is teaching, because they teach that being in subjection to your husband is, is some low thing. No. No. The, the woman who is supporting her husband and raising the children and teaching the children and putting this... Look, she's saving the next generations. She is, she is sealing the next generations of Christians in this world. What is the most important thing to you, husband and wife? It's probably your children. It's probably that they grow up and they get saved and they have children who get saved. I mean, it, this is what a supportive wife who's in subjection to her husband's vision will produce. It's impossible for a man to go to work every day and support his family and lay out a vision and have a wife who won't support that vision and get generational results. It's impossible. It's a hugely important role. There is nothing low about it. You can argue that it's the most important role. That she's at home and she's the one that's going to make those generational decisions. And she's going to do that work and that labor of carrying that vision through to the next generation. Look, it's huge. That's why Proverbs 31 says it's, it's far above rubies. It's priceless, is what the Bible is saying. You are priceless to your husband. But you have to do it God's way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.